and welcome. My name is Janice B. Gordon. I'm co-president of the Professional Speaking Association and visiting fellow of Cranfield School of Management, consulting and training sales teams in key account management and social sales. I'm a professional speaker and talk about scaling your sales. But today I'm up close and personal with the wonderful Alexander Lowe. Hello, Alex. Hi, Janice. Hi. Now, let me introduce Alex first of all. Um, Alex works with teams to understand what it means to help them to understand what it means to be social in the 21st century. And this is in the context of sales and marketing. Uh, as a Microsoft social selling partner, Alex is probably the world's foremost sales navigator expert. <laughs> Alex has over 15 years sales experience. He led social selling programs for an international law firm and a global commercial real estate firm. He now leads the social selling and account-based intelligence practice for digital, digital leadership associates with the lovely Tim Hughes, who I know well. Alexander is at the forefront of understanding the latest technological platforms and how they can be used in a social context, including things like AI that's banded about quite a lot in machine learning. In 2016, he was featured as, a, as the world's top 30 salesperson by LinkedIn. So it's an absolute pleasure to be speaking to you, Alex. Likewise, Janice, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to the next 30 minutes or so, and of course, speaking at your uh, your event in September. Yes, yes, we're, we're gonna be talking more uh, about that. But first of all, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your childhood. What's the one thing that you've taken with you that's really carried you forward and created the biggest impact in your life? I think never give up. Um, I've always had quite a sporty, uh, sporty background. I was very fortunate to have ponies and horses when I was when I was younger. And you literally, when you fell off, you had to get back on the proverbial <laughs> and keep, yeah. trying, keep trying, no matter how much it hurt, maybe hurt at the uh, at the time. And um, you know, you don't become good at something, or you don't become an expert at something overnight. It takes hard work. Uh, dedication and practice. Excellent, excellent. So then tell me about um, being a qualified ski instructor. How did all of that come about? So um, after I was uh, thinking about leaving school and then going on to university, everybody was sort of doing the gap year thing way back in the late 90s, this would have been. Um, and I enjoy skiing. I just saw it as an opportunity to go out into a you know new country. So it was in Quebec in Canada and spent three months learning something that um, I loved. And what was great about it is I wasn't necessarily the best skier um, out of the cohort of 60 people that were there. But again, we were all kind of stripped back to basics. Even if you thought you knew how to ski, you were taught how to ski. And it was three months of um, serious hard work, actually. It was the proper <laughs> nine to five, um, no messing around. And at the end of it, I came out as a level one qualified, uh, qualified ski instructor. And I think the most interesting thing for me was actually having to learn how to teach somebody to ski who's never skied before, because you really had to put yourself into their shoes in terms of teaching the basics, which I then taken forward in terms of, you know, how I consult into sales organizations around how to build social into your overall go to sales market strategy. I would think that that's quite similar to a, a sales director, a sales leader leading a, a team. It's, uh, they often come from being a salesperson on, on the shop floor and then going into leadership. It's a very different skill, isn't it? Actually doing it and actually supporting others to actually do it. Absolutely. And there's some interesting debate online at the moment around do actually high performing salespeople make good sales managers? And more often than not, I would suggest probably not because it's the whole, it's everything around. It's not just doing the selling, it's managing people. People are different. People are, you know, having spent five years in recruitment can be a nightmare to deal with. And it's understanding the, the nuances to get the best out of people. You have to flex your, um, uh, your approach. So your mediocre is the wrong word, but an average salesperson could actually make a really, really good sales manager or sales um, director. It's quite interesting because in this kind of uh, traditional te 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 
industrian fueled um, environment, you would think that if you had a, a an average salesperson that has the potential to be a great leader, he doesn't necessarily have the respect of the team. Uh, indeed. And now we're moving into you know, a whole other debate around remuneration and commission structures. And um, you know, is that actually in the 21st century the best lever to get people to do something? Research back from the 60s was actually proved, proves that money is the worst lever to get somebody to do something in terms of the behaviours that it's... Um, uh, that it drives. And that's why I think overall in terms of sales and marketing in the 21st century, where we are today, what's happening with technology, you mentioned AI, machine learning, all these kind of buzzwords, we're kind of at a watershed moment. And I think, you know, organizations have the opportunity to wake up and kind of smell the coffee, uh, so to speak. And those that get this and recognize the change that is happening and how we can move forward will reap the benefits. And those that don't, they're going to face a challenge over the next, you know, two, three, five, ten years, not only from a recruitment perspective, from an employee engagement perspective, but also just from client, you know, client generation perspective. I really laughed when I read your words. You said whether you call it social selling, digital selling, digital marketing or plain old sales and marketing. It's really about people, processes and technology. Now, do you think, you know, we really get a bit too hung up on all of the technology and and it's and as you say, it's really about your people, processes and technology, whatever you call it. I uh, 100% agree. And I think that too often we've gone into organizations where they've implemented Sales Navigator or they've tried to implement a new CRM system, whatever it might be. And we get told Sales Navigator doesn't work. It is not proving the ROI. Then you go and you sit down with the sales team and you actually understand the reason why. It's got nothing to do with the tool. They have not understood what it means to be social and actually the sales navigator isn't LinkedIn it's an extension of CRM which looks at all access of data into LinkedIn but if you don't understand social more generally then of course you're just going to look, to look at sales navigator as another tool and in fact my most recent blog I actually now adding in data it's data <laughs> people process and technology because we're now in a data-driven world so you should be able to use the data to help people understand the why, the processes, then the how, and then you look at your technology platforms to, to understand how they will fit into the why and the how using data. So uh, it's, it's re I'm getting a bit of feedback here. Yeah. Can you hear it? I, I, no, I'm fine. I'm all good. Okay, let me turn down my volume a little. <laughs> um, so listening to, um, I've listened to the podcast that your company um, puts out and, and you're prolific, absolutely prolific with the amount of content, blogs, articles and, and so forth. Um, is that key to your sales strategy, how you gain your customers? 100%. It's all about content is still king. And that's you know the, the phrase that runs true in um in any marketing opportunity, but even in sales, my back to my hundred cold calls a day way back when, the content of my call was still king, and the content of my call was evidence whether I get the next thirty seconds or the meeting. Now we're in a social world where everything is online, so this is all about with the right content and the right story, you will start to engage your audience. If you accept uh, Gartner's research that fifty-seven percent of the buying journey is done before they engage with a vendor of services or products. So what are they doing? They go online to find information. So if you're providing the right information through the right channels that, that talks to the client around the, the why and the how, whatever that might be, how by working with me, us as an organization, this is the output that you will get in terms of faster, better, more effective, cheap, whatever it might be, then they will start to engage with you. If your content is poor, then you'll get no engagement. Right. Yeah. yeah. So then perhaps we should explain a bit more about what is social selling? What is this that we're talking about? So anybody that follows me or has actually heard me speak on stage, I'll probably caveat that I actually hate the term social selling. Um, it's just sales and marketing for the 21st, uh, 21st century. We've got digital selling, modern selling, any kind of other buzzword you can put before, you know, selling or sales or, or marketing. Social is me merely the channel. Like a phone is a channel, email is the channel. It's a hugely important channel. 
But actually, if we're going to stay with the word social selling, this is all about lead generation. This is all about how do you use social to bring your audience to you to drive inbound so that they are going, I saw that, I read that, somebody recommend I have a conversation with you. Once that happens, you then have to go into your sales processes. If your sales team are poor and cannot close, you can't blame social. You can't blame the content that has led that individual to want to start a conversation with you. That is your sales process. So let's actually, you know, dare I say it, move away from the term social selling and just call it what it is. It's sales and marketing for the 21st century where social is a channel within which to communicate with your, your prospects and your clients. I would I certainly agree, agree with you. you. I, I, I really, really don't, don't like the word social, social selling. selling. It's, it's not, not about selling. selling. No, it isn't. Um, it's really part. misguiding yeah. everyone. People think, oh, I'm going to be selling, I'm I'm be selling, selling on, Twitter on Twitter and, and you know, LinkedIn. And stuff it's like no that's not what you're supposed to be doing so yeah yeah indeed um and i haven't sold anything on social i have started lots of conversations on social which have led to a sale but that sale was a face-to-face -face. many meetings proposals negotiations that but what i can say is those conversations would not have happened without leveraging social in a meaningful and contextual way to start those conversations Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so let's, let's talk, talk about, about the big event that we've got coming up on the 4th of September, September which, which is Stand Up, up Heard. Heard. And, it and it really about your message, message out, out there, there. Your, your voice out, out there. there. And, and many business business owners and, and leaders are selling, selling all, all the time. time. They, they don't, don't realise they're, they're, they're selling. selling. And a lot and of that's, that's to do with your words, words and the presentation, the way that you speak. So, so that you, you can get, can get that engagement, engagement. Uh, uh, so whether so it's written or whether whether it's verbal. And, and so, so I'm really interested, interested in your talk. talk. Why, Why social, social has to be the foundation of your marketing strategy? strategy. Tell, us Tell us more about, about that, Alex. Well, it's kind of building on the themes that we've um, we talked about. So, you know, what I will look to do is kind of strip it all back to basics and just give some 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 context into globally what social actually means you know half the world is now um access to the internet five billion unique mobile phone users nine out of ten pieces of content are now consumed on um uh, social three billion active social media users so your marketing database is not in a crm system even if you use your crm system your marketing database is on linkedin facebook twitter snapchat instagram you know our mantra at digital leadership associates is fish where the fish are so in order to understand where the fish are, you need to go and talk to your clients, your existing client base. Why did you buy from us? Why did we win? Why did we lose? What content are you consuming? How are you consuming it? Is it podcasts? Is it videos? Is it um, long form, short form blogs? Is it email? Some clients still like receiving stuff through, you know, through emails, although based on one client I'm working with in terms of their open rates, which are just diabolical. It's like, why are you doing this? The hundred that open it, fine. Let's work with the hundred that open it. But the 900 that aren't, Let's try and work out where else they might be. So once you understand the context of where your audience is, how do you then engage? How do you use social to engage your audience? And this is all things like your personal brand. So when people meet you for the first time online, are you projecting yourself as a subject matter expert? Because if you look at the latest Miller-Hyman um, research, which is looking at 2018 buyer preferences, we don't want to talk to vendor salespeople. We want to talk to subject matter experts or uh, third party validation. So when you are met for the first time online, and that could even be the profile on your own proprietary company website, what does it say about you? What are the first impressions that you create? Then it's around your network. So you're only as good as your network. So if you've got a poor network and salespeople in the traditional sense tend to be pretty bad at this because they connect with their peers or they don't connect with their clients because what if somebody sees I'm connected? The point is, is that MDs are connected to MDs, IT directors to IT directors, FDs to FDs. So if you're not connected when it comes to using the content and we sell through the network, not to the network, you share some content. If you're just talking in an echo chamber amongst all your other sales professionals, that's pointless. You want your existing clients and champions who are the buyers and influencers are, so FDs, MDs, CEOs, CFOs, what it is, they will like it or comment it. That then moves into their network. Someone else sees it goes, oh, Bob wouldn't be connected to Jane if there wasn't some level of trust. That's interesting. I didn't even know that company even did that. Look at this person's interesting profile. Look at the other trusted network that's over there. You know what? I might actually pick up the phone 
or I might start following this person because they're sharing interesting content. I will then choose to engage with you when I am ready to buy or have a sales conversation, referring back to the Gartner research on that nominal 57% of the due diligence is done before you engage with a, you know, a, a vendor process. So I try and set the context in terms of the, the why this is so critical that social has to be, it absolutely has to be part of your go-to-market strategy. And if it isn't, good luck to you. It's nice now you last person out turn the lights off. <laughs> But there is a real challenge here for small businesses because they don't necessarily have marketing departments. And then when they're out, they may start to lose a bit of control. It loses the brand and the personality. So what would you say to them, a small business that, come on, I haven't got time to do all this content, what would you say that they should do in order to progress? Uh, I get exactly the same challenge with global organizations who have massive marketing departments or social media teams with exactly the same thing. I haven't got time. Um, you have got time. You make time. And this becomes business as usual. So we don't have a marketing department. There are four of us who are core to the to the to the business. There are 12 of us in um, in total. All our content is self-generated. Um, those that maybe get a train into work, you know, I take half an hour on the tube rather than reading a paper or playing Candy Crush, I write a blog article. Um, I will carve out time to do a 20 minute podcast. So rather than maybe doing 100 cold calls, which gets you nowhere, make that time to create content. You can use some level of automation, but be careful. So, you know, scheduling tools such as Hootsuite are massively, massively powerful to schedule your content out into the market. But don't make it look um, automated. But blog, blog could be 300 words. It doesn't have to be, you know, war and peace. And actually we have a very short attention span as people. As long as the points you are getting across are relevant, blended with third party content that's already out there, this is interesting because a quick share, comment, like, whatever it might be. We all are all consuming and slave to the machines, which are mobile phone. So if you download the LinkedIn app, for example, or Twitter app, it takes 30 seconds to do a quick, not even that, 10 seconds to do a quick like, share, comment. So this comes back to the why, and this comes back to the people, the data, people, process, technology. This is change management. This is just changing the way that you think. And for some people, it's scary. For some people, it's risky. What if I do something, I get no engagement? So what? Do it again. So what? Do it again. Learn, iterate. But for people to say, I haven't got time, which I appreciate depending on who you are and what you're doing. With the greatest respect of the world in the 21st century, that doesn't cut it anymore. You and I you know, and that, I know speaking that speaking is powerful, is powerful to promote your expertise. So, so this is precisely this is right, this right, for business leaders who are selling themselves, selling their selling goods, goods and, and their, their, their business. The skills, the skills of speaking, presenting, and conveying your message, message is, really, is critical really critical in building your brand. Your brand. Yeah. Would, you Would you say the same is an area that's really open? Like, like, like. Would you, sorry, you broke up there. Would I say this is an area that is overlooked? Oh, 100%. Real, yeah, 100%. Real. Absolutely. Um, and the great thing about social is you can have a voice. So I was having a debate about this the other day with a um, with a client who was she, she was saying, well, I you know leave maybe 10, 20, 30 voicemails a day. I then might do a bit of social, you know, a bit of a light touch on LinkedIn, a bit of a like or a comment. And then I might follow up, you know, follow up with an email. So I was like, OK, why are you leaving a voicemail? And do they return your call? And she her view was, well, I want them to hear my voice. I want them to at least be familiar with me. And my response is, OK, but you're getting to 20, 30 people who may never call you back. There's this thing called LinkedIn or Facebook where you have a smartphone, 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 three minute, 30 second, whatever it is, record like I do. I don't need any fancy video video software. Just record your your message. But then you could get to thousands of people on social. Not only do they hear your voice, they see your face. They start to understand who you are. People will engage because they like your style and your approach versus those that won't. Not everybody on social will like my style and approach. And I had some interesting <laughs> two weeks ago when I did the one on the car. That created some quite interesting feedback for me, I have to say. Um, but then those that don't like your style and approach, you probably wouldn't want to work with anyway. So by the time people come and engage with me, they already know my style and my approach. So when the face-to-face -face conversation happens, 
they know what they're kind of getting themselves into, if that makes sense. So yeah, yeah. you can be a public speaker, you know, using your phone. Literally, the technology, you know, in the phones today is insane. The opportunity you have to be a public voice in the in the market. And I think that's why video is you look at everything that's happening around video and how organizations are starting, how you can blend that into your overall strategy. But again, it's scary for some people. The first time I did my first ever video, I was terrified. I thought I bit the bullet and just did it. I took feedback. I took, you know, it was initially very static and sitting down rather than being more active. And the feedback was, we don't like it. It's it's static. Just be you. So now I do all kinds of crazy stuff. Just so last week I was sitting in a box, for goodness sake, to talk about getting out of the box. So it's just get out there and just do it. It's really freeing, isn't it, in, uh, that we we have to train ourselves to be ourselves. It's, yeah. it's crazy, it's isn't it? it? And it is, takes it a while, a bit of iteration of actually yeah. watching in front of the camera. So, okay, so, okay, let me be really, let me relax, you know, you know. Absolutely. We're English, are very, we're, very self, we're a very self-effacing culture, and we don't like, we see it as boasting and what have you. And, you know, there is a, there is a scale of how far some people do or don't go with, you know, their, their approach and their, you know, their content. But again, back to the cold calling. If cold calling works, you do it. If that style and approach is actually who you are and what you are, then don't be fake. Don't be something that you think you need to be because you'll just be found out. Just be yourself because, and you raise a very good point, sales is about people. People still buy people. And that is never, ever going to change unless the robots take over um that's a whole different story um but we are still in a people business but more and more of these conversations are happening online rather than necessarily in a face let me look at this we're in a face-to-face -face conversation i'm sitting in my loft up in south wimbledon you're sitting wherever you're sitting are we're having a conversation it's still people yeah, to people yeah. this is the beauty of technology yeah. yeah, and that's and why that's I've always, why I've always embraced, embraced social, social networks. networks. I absolutely, absolutely, absolutely love it. I've got it. connections I've got all over the world. It's fascinating. It's brilliant. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> and I want to talk a bit about um, personal branding. This is a bit of my bugbear. I, it's one of those phrases I really don't like. I mean, we're not we're not cheap and cattle to be branded. And it's one of those terms you can't get away from, like social selling, even though it's something that I find difficult yeah. um because it doesn't embrace the fact that humans are unique and different <laughs> and that's the thing that you know someone will like me because of my my personality because of my values because of my difference they don't like me because i'm the same as everyone else yeah. whereas branding tends to box people in um i don't know what your thoughts are on that so uh yeah it's a fair it's a fair comment and actually this is we can call it your digital self or your digital presence and the 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 challenge is is that we focus on linkedin for the moment because this is where this is born out of and i'm, I'm guilty of this because i spent the best part of five years in recruitment when linkedin first came to market everybody saw linkedin as a job board so we projected ourselves on linkedin as telling your next employer how good i am at what i do and we all you know if you're in marketing sales accounting finance it you all follow a kind of formulaic approach which means to your point ultimately you all look like the person next to you you're all sheep you can't really tell each other apart so the whole point about personal brands digital self digital presence whatever it is is are you the person that you that someone meets online are you that same person that you meet in a face-to-face -face environment and i say 90 percent of the time no it's not because you're projecting yourself based on the next job you're going to get, not on how you will help your audience who you are selling to or marketing to help them achieve what it is that you do. And again, I don't care whether you're a salesperson, an accountant, a lawyer, real estate broker, it doesn't matter. Anybody who's in a client facing role needs to understand that you have to project who you are as a subject matter expert. Absolutely. To use your turn of phrase, we are all unique. People buy people because of our uniqueness. That's not even a word, because we are unique. Um, so bring that to life, bring that to bear on digital, social, you know, whatever the channel is. I think people do have a, um, a, a bit of a mindset shift with this about, you know, being personal and not 
not exposing themselves and especially more senior leaders as as well i don't know if you've coached um senior leaders to actually very much be themselves, um, have an opinion. Um, and then you've got marketing and or PR person behind them saying, don't be yourself. Don't say anything I haven't told you to say. How do you balance those two things? Um, I come across that all the time. And yes, working with, you know, senior partners at law firms and, you know, can we're talking major global inter you know, international organizations here. Um, it's common sense. And not everybody follows common sense, but if you want your parents to see, if you wouldn't want it to on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, the FT, don't say it. And you're having an opinion, not necessarily a legal opinion or an accounting position opinion, but the same as somebody would ask you in a meeting or at a conference, that thing that just happened, that event in this market, what's your view? Well, this is interesting because my view on this is X, Y, um, X, Y, Z. I'm not suggesting go all Facebook. I see some posts which you think, oh, that's a bit too personal. So for me, I keep a balance in terms of what's happening in my business life if I feel it's appropriate, but I don't go anywhere near my personal life because that is personal not necessarily relevant to um to my audience that's not to say that when i build a relationship with somebody in a face-to-face -face environment i would then share that i've had no sleep because of my five-month-old baby or whatever you know whatever it might be but you still have to earn that trust and respect before you necessarily go down that route so it comes down to common sense um, most organizations you've actually got permission to do this it's just the framework and the context within which you are doing it it's interesting, I was having a conversation with um, John Garrett, he's um, a speaker comedian uh, in, in America, and he, you know, he's kind of really um, very, very popular. And his thing is all about, he does a podcast, um, I think it's called the Green Apple Podcast, and talks about you know, what's the thing that you're most passionate about and whether that's a football team or whatever it may be, but within cultures, within organizations, it makes you better at doing whatever you do because you have this passion outside of work. It's got nothing to do with work because you have this quirky thing that you've always done as a child that nobody knows about and you do in some dark corner somewhere. I don't know. But, you know, that's the thing that makes you most interesting and in how people are able to do the job they do because they have this other thing. I don't know what your view is on that. I think passion is is key and it's having sort of branched out and now doing my thing with you know with Tim and Adam and Phil within Digital League Associates, the freedom it's given me because I'm not stuck within the construct of a corporate framework. That's not to say that I was having a negative experience in my previous roles, but my passion is a technology. I'm a geek, I love learning about new things, but actually going in to help organizations understand what this all means. And when you see that light bulb moment, even if it's one person for me that just gives me a real buzz to then carry on it's like if i get one like or i get one message on any of my posts going you know what this has changed the way i think about stuff that for me is like right i'm going to carry on and do the next thing because i've helped one person think differently about how they're going to approach things so passion is critical if you haven't got it you probably need to move on from where you are Excellent. Right. I've got some quick fire questions um, for you. Uh, it's been absolutely fascinating, but let's see how you answer these. So what's the one thing you haven't done yet? Written a book. Uh, what are you most passionate about and why? My family, because once you become a parent, you realise your whole focus on life changes completely. And now I do everything for my uh, my kids. Brilliant. If you're on a desert island on your own, what's the one thing you would take with you? Uh, a book. <laughs> <laughs> the book that I've written. No, typewriter to write the book that I'm going to write. <laughs> Finally, you get some time to do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed talking to you and, and, and can't wait to get you on, on stage. I'm going to be there with my notebook, just <laughs> writing yeah. down all of this information, because although... You know, there's a lot that I do around this, this area. You can never, ever learn enough. And I know that you're really at the kind of leading edge of what's coming out and technology and all the shortcuts and all the things that, you know, will, will keep us all up to date. So I'm really, really glad that you've agreed to attend the, the conference. I'll be posting more details um, with the link um, below here. But first, I'd like to say thank you so much for giving up 
your your time and and your knowledge here today. Thank you, Alex. It's been my absolute pleasure, and I look forward to seeing everybody on the uh, on the fourth. Yeah. All right. Take care. Bye bye.